what exactly is the nature of law and what is the purpose of law in society? The purpose of law is to establish the principles of conduct governing human relationships in a society which would respect individual rights. Without some sort of individual rights, no rule of law would be possible. What is the difference between objective and non-objective law and what are the consequences in society of each? Well, that is one of the most important questions today. An objective law is a law which defines objectively what constitutes a crime or what is forbidden and the kind of penalties that a man would incur if he performs the forbidden action. Objective means definable, graspable by a rational consciousness. Therefore, an objective law would be a law which a man can understand and apply so that every man ahead of committing an action would be able to tell what is the crime forbidden, what penalty would he incur if he commits it, and can make a decision accordingly. Now, a non-objective law is one which cannot be defined. It means a law without specific definition, which may have as many different interpretations as there are men. A citizen cannot tell what is permitted or forbidden. He cannot tell what action is socially accepted, what action will be punished, and what will be the nature of the punishment. A non-objective law is left strictly at the interpretation of the authorities, usually the judges under dictatorships, it would be the commissars, but in any case, a non-objective law is one which a man cannot interpret himself, a law that is not defined and is, is in fact undefinable. The best example of it is, of course, antitrust legislation, where a man cannot tell what is permitted to him or what is forbidden and may commit a crime without knowing that he's doing it. Mr. Ryan, a very popular legal doctrine holds that law is actually what judges say it is, and that legislative enactments are only sources of the law which the judges use to derive what they believe the law is. Do you believe this is a primary cause of the present say, state of non-objective law? Uh, it's not the primary cause, it's one of the manifestations. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Justice Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who originated that doctrine. He was the, the worst philosophical influence on American law. That is a statement of pure non-objectivity. This is the formula for tyranny. If the laws are whichever the judges interpret, I don't see the purpose of having any laws at all. It would simply mean that whichever the judges or the authorities decide at any given moment will determine what happens to the citizens of a country. It is not a formulation of law, it's the destruction, the negation of the concept of law. For a tyranny to establish itself, non-objective laws are required. If its laws, its edicts are objective, such a government is not a tyranny. It does not have an arbitrary power over the citizens. And you will observe in all histories that there never has been such a combination. To be tyrannical, a government power has to be arbitrary. And the only means to an arbitrary rule are non-objective laws and ex post facto laws, which means a law passed retroactively. So the action which you took while it was legal becomes illegal. You are penalized for it. Now that is typical non-objective law. It is incidentally forbidden in the Constitution explicitly, and yet it is being practiced on a wider and wider scale constantly. In any realm where an objective law cannot be formulated, this is a sign that no law should be formulated. If it cannot be objectively legislated, then there is no reason why the decision of one man, specifically a judge or a bureaucrat, should be superior to the decision of another man, the citizen. What is the purpose of legislation? There is only one objective purpose, the protection of individual rights. Would you say, Ms. Rand, that the range of discretion of a judge might, however, be larger in some areas than in others? The general principle has to be defined by law. The application may be left up to the judge. Since so many circumstances may enter into every given crime, and there may be mitigating circumstances, etc., or the past record uh, of the offender, it is proper to leave that discretion to the judge, again, under objectively defined rules and within an objectively defined limit. But you couldn't leave it up to the judge to decide whether a pickpocket should be given a month in jail or should be executed. 
In a society with such a plethora of regulations and statutes and laws on the books, do you think it's ever proper for ignorance of the law to be used as a justification? Speaking in principle, no, you could not make ignorance of the law a justification because it is uh, too subjective on the part of the citizen. In other words, uh, anyone in any given case could claim that he didn't know the law, and if he wanted to break it, he'll make sure that he didn't know it or say so. Therefore, it would not be a proper principle. But today, our legislatures are running hog wild in the opposite direction. That is, today, nobody can really know the law firsthand. And I think the proper corollary of the principles that ignorance of the law is no defense should be the obligation on the lawmakers to make their laws objective and intelligible so that everyone could have some understanding and some ideas of what the law consists of. Mr. Rand, today we have many laws known as preventive laws. In other words, society feels that a certain course of action on the part of some people in the population will lead to illegal acts. Therefore, they, pre they prevent the entire population from engaging in certain, what otherwise would be considered non-illegal uh, actions. How do you feel about preventive laws? Well, preventive law is, of course, a concept that belongs only in a dictatorship. It is a strictly statist concept because, uh, you say, society feels. Well, now, there is no such thing as society. It's simply a group of men. Therefore, some legislators have no right to decide what other people may or may not do, nor guess as to what someone's intentions will be. More than that, you do not hold the total population, including the best of your citizens, to the levels indulged in only by the worst. In other words, if carried out to its consistent extreme, we would have to have a curfew law forbidding everybody to step out after dark because some small minority of people might indulge in, in crimes. Passing a martial law forbidding everybody to leave their house at night would be a pure example of preventive law. There is no conceivable excuse or justification for it. You mentioned that a shoplifter should not be threatened with death. Uh, what is the guiding principle in determining what remedy is appropriate to what offense? Here, the uh, principle should be established by means of hierarchical order. That is, in devising a proper penal system, one would have to begin by arranging in a hierarchical order you start with the smallest and the worst crimes that could be committed. Then you establish the minimum penalty and the maximum penalty that you can impose. Then every other crime has to be rated according to the hierarchy in between, which is how most legal systems do establish penalties. If it is true that in law we must hold the citizen to the standard of a rational man, of a man who possesses free will and is able to control his actions, but we come to the problem of children and of persons who are insane, and obviously we wouldn't hold these persons to the same standard, or would we? In principle, I would say that certainly a minor, a child, or an insane person cannot be held responsible for his actions in the same way as a normal, healthy adult. In the case of an insane person, one would have to put him out of circulation in the sense of preventing him from committing further crimes, but one could not in, impose on, upon him a punishment which is intended and deserved only by the man who is conscious of his actions. Given that uh, we know what the law is and that the law is objective, we still have the, the problem of establishing the fact of the case. I wonder if you would comment on this problem in law, particularly in relation to the question of capital punishment. The main purpose of the law in a practical sense is precisely to establish the rules of evidence so that if people have been wronged or injured, they would not settle their disputes by resorting to force personally. In a civilized society, the citizens have delegated to the government retaliatory use of force, that is, the power of defending them on the basis of their right of self-defense. And the reason why this power has to be delegated to the government is to establish objective rules of evidence. But now you're asking about the issue of capital punishment. I would say, in principle, morally, I approve of capital punishment. That is, if someone, by conscious, deliberate intention, has murdered someone, he does morally deserve to forfeit his own life. But the issue of objective proof 
uh, enters here. And I think a good argument could be made, and I would be inclined to agree with it, that precisely because errors in proof and evidence are always possible, capital punishment should be outlawed, not out of moral consideration for the murderer, but in order to protect the possible rare instance of an innocent man being convicted. It is better to sentence nine actual murderers to life imprisonment rather than execute one innocent man.